Fire Call, the Fire Safety Show with Division Chief Jim Sedaris. Hi, my name is Division Chief Jim Sedaris, and you are watching Fire Call. We're going to take you all over the city of Sioux Falls, hanging out with Sioux Falls Fire Rescue, meet some of the crews. This show, we got it jam-packed with stuff. We're going to go to a house explosion, see what happens, what causes those house explosions. We're going to hang out with uh, Hazardous Materials guys, and we're going to work with the Army National Guard on Hazardous Materials. We're going to talk about fire pits. A lot of people got them. Got to stay safe with those. And we got shout outs. We're going to talk about what goes on in house explosions and backdrafts. So we got a lot of stuff to cover. And also we got shout outs. Now, if we do a shout out for you or answer your question, we send you a sassy Sioux Falls Fire Rescue t-shirt. But only for those good questions or shout outs. And we got shout outs today from all over. First shout out goes to Bruce. Bruce lives in Orland, California. And he wants a shout out to the Orland 100% Volunteer Fire Department in Orland, California. We got a shout out to Eric. Eric lives in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. He wants one to the Bethlehem Township Volunteer Fire Department where his dad is an ambulance captain. And it looks like Eric's going to be following in the footsteps of the fire service. And the final shout out is from Tyler. Tyler lives in New, New Hartford, Connecticut. And he wants a shout out to the New Hartford Fire Department Engine Company number five in New Hartford, Connecticut. So sit back, hang out with the guys and gals of Sioux Falls Fire Rescue, and we'll show you some fun stuff. We've got some great questions about hazardous materials, also known as hazmat. We're going to get to those questions right now. And with me to answer the questions is one of our favorite captains, Ed Van Egdom, also known as Smooth Ed, <laughs> Too Tall Ed, and Just Ed. Just Ed. Okay. First question, Ed, is from Matthew. Matthew lives in Holly, Michigan. And Matthew wants to know, in a hazmat situation, where should firefighters park the fire truck and how far away? All right, Matthew. Standard procedure is to park the fire truck upwind in case the product is a vapor, you want it blowing away from you. Standard procedure is also to park the fire truck uphill in case the product is a liquid, you want it running down the hill away from you. And what we have for uh, the rule of thumb? A guide is the rule of thumb. If you can hold up your thumb and your thumb covers that problem, then you're far enough away. Perfect, Ed. Thank you. That's why we picked you. <laughs> okay, ready for this next one? I'll try. Okay, doing good so far. You are on a roll, my friend. All right. This one comes from Jack. Jack lives in Overland Park, Kansas. Overland Park, home of a very good, world-renowned combat challenge team. Right. He would like to know, is there a difference between a firefighter and a hazmat firefighter? There is. Uh, all our firefighters go through the same training to do structural firefighting, but then some of the guys go through additional and training. And gals. And gals go through additional hazmat training, either provided here or provided off our sites, and they go through all the instruction that's needed to get that hazmat tech certification and then they come back and work on our hazmat teams. And there are a couple levels. We have hazmat awareness, Yep. tech, Ops. operations. There you go. Okay. And this is another question. This is a question from one of our repeat viewers, Sasha, in Arlington, Massachusetts. And they specifically want to know is how do you know when hazardous materials might be involved in a call and when would you call the hazmat team out and why would they wear special suits? Okay. So a three part question. Uh, there's a lot of different ways we might know that hazmat's involved. We might get a report from the public when they dial 911 and call in. They may know that something has happened that involves a product they're dealing mm -hmm. with. We might have some they sort of... They might know that it's a hazardous materials already. Exactly. Sure. That might be part of their work, you know, dealing with hazmat. <laughs> they might have an accident. The other way is if there's some sort of plume or spill or indication that there's What's something on the ground. A plume is a cloud that floats downwind. It's, okay. it's something that proceeds off of the product. Sure. Uh, if we have that or if we have a spill on the ground, something that people know shouldn't be there that's unidentifiable to them, we may get a call and say this is an unidentified possible hazmat situation. Especially if you were to have a 55 gallon drum tipped over, exactly. a container tipped over that's leaking yep. or spilling. Yep, anything with the uh, NF or the 704 markings, mm -hmm. the red, white, and blue diamond, those kind of things, we see that. 
we know right away there's some indicator that that's a hazmat mm -hmm. situation. Captain Ned, thank you for your help. Hey, thank you, Jim. Really appreciate it. Next question is a two-parter, and it's a shout out. It comes from Harrison. Harrison lives in Warwick, New York, and he wants a shout out to the Goodwill Hook and Ladder Company One of Warwick Fire Department in Warwick, New York. And the second part of his question is, what weapons of mass destruction or all hazard capabilities does Sioux Falls Fire Rescue have? Well, we got something going on really cool that we need to talk about. We have a lot with Sioux Falls Fire Rescue, but when we have something really big going on, we're gonna call in the big guns. We're gonna call in the South Dakota National Guard, and I have Don Swartz with me, and he's with the 82nd Civil Support. And you might have saw him last time, last time this year, but tell us about the whole new concept of we're getting away from Weapons of Mass Destruction, WMD, to all hazards. Explain that a little bit. Okay, if we started out as a Weapons of Mass Destruction then. After uh, the um, uh, hurricanes down in New Orleans, mm -hmm. and we responded with a lot of comm units down there, it became an all hazards team. So we can respond to uh, uh, floods, natural disasters, we can respond to WMDs, uh, whether it's a, a bio or a chemical, so or, pretty or much anything that goes on, Absolutely. we can bring you the support. Yep. We are we are a asset to the governor. So when the governor decides that he wants to use us in a natural disaster, uh, we belong to the, the state. So that's where we go. And then you would come to us, and we talked about this once before. When we talked about incident command system. You would fit right into the incident command system Absolutely. in a specific role. Now yep. we're doing WMD today. Mm -hmm. What are, what are the guys actually doing as far as uh, the drill today? The drill today is uh, we have this large building and, and we're doing some entries, joint entries with the Sioux Falls Fire Department and with the 82nd Civil Support Team. And what they're doing is a site characterization of the interior which of the means, building. Which means site what? characterization means the interior of the building. They're looking at what's in there that shouldn't be in there mm -hmm. in this type of type of building. And so they're going to go around and they're going to look at everything and they're going to if they see something that looks out of place, okay, they're going to take some photos. They're going to call it back to operations. Uh, the incident commander, which is always a firefighter or a police officer, mm -hmm. it's never the military, okay, we, uh, they'll call that back, they'll make a recommendation, we find some liquid that's not supposed to be in there, we'll do a sample, and that's what we're doing today. We're doing a dry sample and a liquid sample. They'll come across a dry sample and a liquid could sample. could be a powder. could be a powder, it could be a clear liquid. It, it, we're, in this case, we're using a powder, which is a granular like mm -hmm. salt. Uh, we're using some clear liquid and we're using some yellow liquid, okay? And because the the, uh, the color of the liquid makes a big big difference sure. of what we're looking for, okay? And usually it's what's making the person sick, uh -huh. okay? And so what we'll do is we'll take samples, we'll we'll track it, we'll bring it back, we'll bring it back to our analytical lab, and and our science officer will look at it and try to determine of what that liquid is. And because you don't know what it is, everybody has to be essentially everybody has to up. be. It's, it's an unknown. It's an unknown to us, so we automatically go into the highest level of protection we can, which is the level A suits that you see the guys behind us coming out of. Okay. They're on SCBAs, level A suits. That's the highest self-protection you can get. And Don, we love to have you here, and we hope to train hey, more with we you. We love to come back. Invite <laughs> us anytime. Yeah, we will. Thanks, right. Don. Yeah. firefighter you never know what you're gonna have this is an early morning call came in at quarter to five it's still dark everybody's sleeping neighbors hear a huge explosion take a look and this house behind us is gone what I have with me is Captain Mark Ager Mark was the first crew to show up on this call this is a house explosion and Mark when you got here what, what was your dispatch what were you dispatched to well initially we were dispatched for an explosion about eight blocks away from here Oh, really? And then shortly after that, it came in as a structure fire over on Lansdowne, which is a block to the east of where we're at right now. So when we got in the area, my driver happened to take a look before he took Lansdowne, and he says, I see all kinds of debris everywhere. So we headed down towards Lansdowne. I didn't see any of this. We headed down Lansdowne, didn't see anything until we got to the corner, and he goes, look over there. And we saw this This house was just, just a ball of fire. It was just a heap of wood totally involved and it looked like part of it was pushing against the house on what we call the delta side to sure. the north and uh, we pulled on scene we took a hydrant from a long ways away because the hydrant that we have right here with all the debris I didn't know what was going to happen so we took one from a block away pulled into our location where we're at right here and my main concern was life safety with the explosion I didn't know what we were going to have for injuries 
uh, people involved here. We were getting all kinds of reports. There were bystanders everywhere. I was just trying to hit real quick, you know, mm -hmm. people living here, there. You know, is everyone okay? Is everyone accounted for? And the only ones we couldn't account for at the moment were the people of the house involved and uh, the second house. And we had rumor, or we had uh, information that the people in the Delta Division may be out of town on vacation. So we were thankful in that regard. But and it right, took a couple hours. I mean, to find out that we, accountability for these folks that they weren't home, but it could have been. Oh yeah, it it this could have been a lot more severe than it ended up. Um, Right yeah, away. What would you do when you sit up? And you got your truck here, you got the stick up. When we pulled up, there was so much fire, and as close as we were to the house on the Delta side, I was more worried about the exposure, but I knew the amount of fire that we had that a two and a half wasn't going to be enough to make a dent in it. So I said, let's put the ladder in the air and start flowing water up against that exposure, sure. trying to at least cool that down where we can get a thousand gallons a minute as opposed to big, 250 gallons. Big a minute. fire, big water. Big fire, big water, and that's what we did. So our big concerns are when we think about, we have an acronym we call RECIO, and the first one is rescue, then exposures. Let's not get, let's keep this fire in one spot and not keep it from spreading to the neighbor's house, and there, there's significant damage there. Yeah, absolutely, and it, when we first pulled up, I wasn't concerned about the structure, it was gone. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I was more concerned with the exposure on the Delta side, seeing what we could do, and honestly, I thought we'd probably lose that the way it was looking in the beginning, but crews got in there and did an excellent job. You know, a well, nice job, Mark, and I mean, it's, it's an unfortunate situation. Could have been a lot worse. So your good, quick thinking really helped the neighborhood here. All right. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. You betcha. We had a large house explosion that blew this house not only off the foundations, but we have debris scattered uh, 300 feet away. We have damage to neighboring houses. And with me, I have our new operations chief, division chief, although your helmet says battalion chief, division chief, John Groen. John, got some questions for you. I'll lay them on me. <laughs> When we look at this fire, now people are going to say, how come they're letting the fire burn? They have, uh, have a hose line here that could easily put that out. What's the reason? Well, the reason we do that is because if we get the, the gas put out, it's still leaking at this point. Mm -hmm. And then it causes another risk of uh, further explosions. So, so we're gonna, better off containing the fire and until, yep, and letting it burn until uh, we can get the gas company in here and they can get the gas shut off to those meters. So if we put it out, essentially we could have a fire someplace else then, another explosion. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, now, what are some concerns that we have? Uh, this house is just gone. We have debris everywhere. What are some of the safety concerns, not only for our firefighters, but the people in, in the surrounding neighborhood have to be worried about? Well, right now, one of the biggest concerns is the debris from the house. We have a very large debris field. Uh, there's shattered glass, like you had said earlier, 300 foot direction. Mm -hmm. um, we're right next to Baker Park. There's a lot of debris in Baker Park. Now, as the ops chief, when you come on scene, something like this, when we have we have parts of this house past the next house. What are some of the concerns that you have in reigning in control over the chaos that's going on and when you first initially arrive on scene, which we've been on scene now for probably two hours, almost three hours? Well, you know, my first concern is to make sure that the, the on-scene incident commander has the resources he needs. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Captain Van Egdom was our uh, incident command and still is. He uh, did have, he had called a second alarm and uh, had the fire contained to the uh, two buildings that were involved initially and had checked with the other ones to make sure that we had it all contained. Mm -hmm. So so it's just getting getting a handle on it. And make sure you have enough resources. Great. Well, thanks, John, and hopefully in the rest of your career you're not going to have too many of these. <laughs> yeah, it's not a good way to start this out. No. But uh, um, luckily there's uh, no injuries at this point, so that's, that's always a plus. Great. Thanks, John. Every day in the fire department is different. You never know what you're going to get called to. And as we've been watching through this show, crews are going to go from one extreme to the other, hazmat to buildings being uh, building explosions. And that's why the job of a firefighter is always changing, always dynamic, you never know what you're going to have. And you can see the power of this explosion is something you just don't see every day, including roof trusses blown over another house stuck into this one. That's what makes firefighting a challenging job and it takes a special group of people to do this job day in and day out over long careers. Hey, now we wrap this up, let's go to another part of the show. Here we are, we're gonna look at the truck of the month. The truck of the month is a new command car. And with me for truck of the month is Battalion Chief Joe Luther. Hi, Jim. Doing, Joe? 
Doing good, Jim. How long have you been in the department? Uh, 24 years. Wow. How long have you been in BC? Uh, two and a half years. What do you think so far? It's a fun job. Good job. I like yeah. doing it. Well, you're going to walk us through. This is your rig, essentially. This is the one you drive when you come to work? Correct. What do you Correct. think of it? Because this is new now. We went to a pickup style. Yep. Um, it's We've uh, usually used uh, Suburbans in the past, but uh, we went to this pickup style. Um, it's got a lot of advantages over the, uh, uh, the Suburbans. Um, there's more room. Um, okay. We've got less noise in the cab because of the equipment is carried in the back. Oh, sure. That's a good idea. Um, and we went back to the traditional red. Traditional it's, it's red. Everybody the, loves the traditional isn't red. Isn't that the truth? Now, inside the vehicle, now you have a computer. What do you, people are going to say, what do you use a computer for? And how is it hooked up? Because we're hooked up wirelessly. We have a wireless network throughout the, the city. They do send us our dispatch information. Mm -hmm. I can also uh, access our local city's network and transfer files that I need on the fire scene and whatnot. So if you have a major incident and you have multiple buildings involved, you can pull all that information out? I can pull a lot of the building information and, and any other uh, pertinent files that I might need. And you have right a, a camera up on top on the, on the uh, dash. What do we use the camera for? If we have big, uh, big fire instances, we uh, like to take that and film that, mm -hmm. and then we can review that at our uh, uh, post. Uh, Incident analysis. Correct. <laughs> now, you were talking that the equipment isn't carried in the back like a Suburban. It's carried essentially in the bed of this pickup. Can you tell us kind of what we have back here? Well, we've got, uh, um, we've got like an extra SCBA bottle. Okay. We've got uh, a minimal usage uh, ME, uh, EMS supplies mm -hmm. and some uh, uh, sensors. We also have our RIT team bag, which uh, has all the, the tools needed for our, our rapid, rapid intervention, intervention team. teams. Okay, now, how do you pull all this out? You, there's no sides on it. Correct. There's just a uh, one lever, and then everything can slide, slide out for easy access. Well, we have the question. One of the questions from our viewers, and this is from Jesse. Jesse lives in Omaha, Nebraska. And one of the questions Jesse has is, what should drivers do as you're coming up behind them and they start seeing red lights in their rearview mirrors, what should drivers do when they see emergency vehicles coming down the road? Well, state law requires that the, the drivers pull off to the right and stop. Okay. Sometimes that's not possible with the traffic and the road conditions, so we ask them to simply just stop. So if they can't, and that's the next part of Jesse's question, is if someone's at a busy intersection and they can't pull over to the road, you suggest they just stop? Just and stop and acknowledge the fact that we're behind them, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Perfect. So that's what we want to do. Go to the right, like Joe says, and if you're stuck, just stay there. Don't try and scoot off because the trucks aren't going to know what you're doing when they're coming up behind you. Well, thanks a lot, Joe, and appreciate it. I hope you have fun with your new truck. You bet. Thanks, Jim. Welcome to FIT, the Fire Institute of Technology, where we answer those tough probing questions that you're asking out there. And we have three questions about the same issue. And first one comes from Conrad. Conrad lives in Thornton, Ontario, Canada. Stephen. Stephen lives in Blue Point, New York. And our last one's from Mike. Mike lives in Downington, Pennsylvania. And they want to know what's the difference between a backdraft and a flashover. And that's what we're going to talk about. Both these are very serious conditions. Firefighters are always worried about both of them, especially a backdraft. Now we're going to talk, let me get my handy dandy marker. Now if we have a building, not to scale, not our house here. Now if we have, we're going to talk about backdrafts first. What happens with a backdraft? We have a fire in a building, but these buildings are all closed up really tight. So we don't have a lot of oxygen getting into that building. We'll have the fire burning inside, and what we'll see on the outside a lot of times is these windows will not be broken, and they'll be darkened, soot colored. Oftentimes up in the eaves we'll see smoke venting out, puffing out almost, just kind of puffing out. Well, we've got to be thinking backdraft. What a backdraft is is this fire's gotten down so it's almost in a big smoldering phase. It's hot in there, stuff to burn, but there's not the component that's necessary and that's oxygen. So what happens is if you go in, boot this door and you kick down the door right away, you bust out this glass, 
all that oxygen, I've got our little oxygen is going to flow into that house, rapidly flow in there. And what happens is, all it's going to come in and you're going to get a big explosion called a backdraft. Sucks in the oxygen. Now we have that fuel, we have the heat, and we have the oxygen necessary for one heck of almost an explosion. Easy way to get killed for firefighters in these backdrafts is they'll go in and knock that door in without thinking. So that's something we have to be cautious of. But that's, we're, we're starved for oxygen. That's our backdraft. A little different with a flashover. Flashovers are going to be inside of a room. We have our room here. We have all our contents in here. We've got a fire going. This could be a large room too. It could be the size of a, uh, literally there have been large buildings and event centers that have flashovers. You get a fire, what happens is the temps of this fire just start to go way up. Temperatures go up and all of a sudden it hits that point where everything in this room is offloading gases. It's getting hotter in there. Oxygen's feeding in and then at one point this whole thing hits a point, a temperature where everything's going to burn at once and literally the fire here, because it's hot, flashes across that room. Moving so fast you can't outrun this thing. It's very hot. The only way you're going to save yourself in a flashover is hit the ground and get a protective, uh, get your hose nozzles up and protect yourself, but that fire's going to come right over the top and it's going to burn very fast. Everything in that room is going to be cooked off at one time. So there, the difference, high temps, you got everything involved, the room flashes over at one time, hence the name flashover. Backdraft, we need that oxygen. We get that oxygen in, and now we get this whole thing cooking off. So those are some good questions, basic firefighting questions. If you've got questions like that, email us in. We'll try to answer them, and that's what FIT is all about. Got a couple questions on fire pits. Fire pits are going to be more and more common. And this first question is from Marshall. Marshall wants to know about the regulations associated with fire pits. Well, I could answer this one, but let's get America's favorite fire inspector to help us. Fire Inspector John Wagner. Thanks, Jim. Okay. What, what are some of the regulations about these fire pits? You know, how far away should they be from your home? Can you, can you have them right outside the door? What's some of those some of those ideas on where to put these things? Well, we've got a lot of fire pits in Sioux Falls mm -hmm. now, and they're, uh, nice. they're very popular. Mm -hmm. uh, but the main thing is to keep it 15 feet away from any structure. Okay. Um, because the heat given off by the fire pit can eventually warm up different parts of uh, the area, so you don't want your siding or anything else to catch on fire eventually. So just be safe, keep it 15 feet away. Uh, if you have a below ground or in ground fire pit, mm -hmm. it can't be any bigger than three feet in diameter. Oh, really? So, is that just to keep too much stuff from, from getting in there? Exactly. The bigger you get, the bigger the fire is, okay. the more chance you have of something happening. So three feet in diameter with earthen walls or bricks, whatever mm -hmm. else works for you. Or you can get like an above ground fireplace like this model here. Um, after you get it 15 feet away from your house and you get an approved type product put in, uh, we want you to make sure that, number one, you only use clean firewood. Okay, so I can't just grab cut down branches and save up branches and throw it in there and burn it? Uh, exactly. You know, and a lot of people in, in the old days used to be able to burn things in Sioux mm -hmm. Falls and burn barrels like leaves and things like that. Mm -hmm. Anymore now it's a health hazard so we don't allow that uh, okay. between the fire department and the health department. So clean firewood, you can burn charcoal in there if you want to. Those are about the only two things. And, and cook little hot dogs over there? Cook little hot dogs over there, that's fine. What about screens? I noticed that we have a screen on this one. It's nice to have a screen. You don't have to have a screen but what the screen does is it keeps the embers that mm -hmm. come up from the firewood from maybe flying over onto your roof or over onto your patio furniture and starting a fire. Okay. So if you've got a screen, use it. Um, it keeps those things in place and keeps everything safe. Okay. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is if a fire does start because of a fire pit, it gets outside the pit, you need to have a garden hose or maybe a fire extinguisher, a bucket of sand or dirt available mm -hmm. to quench the fire in case it does spread. And call 911? And call 911 will come out. Um, you have to have knowledge of the fire. Okay. As far as so you can't just have, say your, your, your kids come over and want to have a fire for their friends and everything mm -hmm. else, but they don't really know about it, you need to get permission from the homeowner to do it. Okay. You can't just go do it in someone's yard because you want to. And then the main thing has is, is been important recently is, is the smoke nuisance. Mm -hmm. um, if you get smoke from your fire bothers a neighbor. So like for here, if one of the neighbors calls up and said, hey, the smoke's bothering me. Right. You have to put it out by code, okay. by, by the health or smoke nuisance code that the health department has. So some people have allergies. Sometimes the smoke mm -hmm. just goes the wrong way and fills up someone else's house. 
Uh, respect gotcha. your neighbors. You bet. And put it out. Be a nice neighbor. Yeah, we don't have to have the fire department come and ask you to put it out nicely. Got another question from Gail. Gail lives in Sioux Falls, and Gail wants to know they're very popular, but they had a friend of theirs was injured while lighting a fire pit. What are some important safety tips as far as lighting these and having uh, and putting wood on? And what would you suggest as far as those tips for Gail? Well, those are good questions. Oh, only uh, the smartest viewers are watching Fire Call. Of course. Uh, basically, the only person that should light the fire pit should be an adult, mm -hmm. a responsible person. Um, stack the wood up nicely once you get it to where you want to. Uh, you could put a little bit of lighter fluid on there if you want to light the wood, but don't use gasoline. And once the fire is going, don't ever put any lighter fluid or gasoline on the fire mm -hmm. because, of course, it could flare up and, and in turn you'll get burned from that. Monitor the fire until it goes out. I mean, if you decide, I'm going to go to bed now, but the fire's still going, it's still glowing, pour some water on it or something else, make sure it goes out because you don't want to leave that there where something could happen overnight. And these metal, this, like with this tub, these metals are going to get hot and they're going to stay hot for a while. Exactly. It's a good idea to keep at least three feet distance around it for the little kids and stuff, mm -hmm. uh, just to warn them that they can get burned. It's real easy to trip and fall onto it, so just respect the fire, stay away from it, and enjoy it. Well, John, I, we appreciate it, and our, our viewers appreciate it. Well, I'm glad I could help tonight. <laughs> Thanks, John. All right, John. We've said it before, and I'll say it again. Firefighting is never the same thing every day. You never know what you're going to happen. Are you going to be going on a cardiac arrest? Are you going to be going on a hazmat call? Or you could have a neighborhood where a house exploded. And that's what makes this job so interesting, so challenging, and that's why you got to stay on top of our game when you're a firefighter. I got it. One question and a shout out. This question is from Aaron. Aaron lives in Sioux Falls. Aaron was watching the news about that house explosion and Aaron wants to know, is there anything we should do to be proactive or take special precautions to prevent a house explosion like that? Well, the biggest thing, Aaron, is if you smell natural gas in your house, has that funny odor that they put into the natural gas. If you smell natural gas, you need to get you and your family outside the house and when you're outside, you call 911. It doesn't take much to set those natural gas explosions off. So it's best to be safe, get out of the house, and then call 911. Don't go back in and try and save stuff. Firefighters will take care of you and we'll be there really quick. So thanks, Aaron. That's a good question, good safety tip. And of course, good questions like that, especially from Sioux Falls folks, they're gonna get themselves a Sioux Falls Fire Rescue t-shirt. Everybody wants Sioux Falls Fire Rescue t-shirt, best department in the country. And this uh, shout out, couple of shout outs here that are pretty amazing. This one's from Cody. Cody. Cody lives in Sioux City, Iowa. Cody wants a shout out to the Woodbury County Emergency and Disaster Services. And we know those people down there have, have cut their teeth on some pretty big disasters and we appreciate their hard work. This next one's from Espen. Espen lives in Norway. And Espen would like a shout out to the Kristiansen Norway Fire Department where they wait for every new episode of Fire Call and they watch it on our site right on www.siouxfalls.org backslash fire call. And the last shout out is from James. James lives in Corsica, South Dakota, wants a shout out to the Corsica Volunteer Fire Department. I'm glad you could hang with us for the whole show. Great to hang out with the crews on the hazmat calls. See what happens when we have a house explosion. What's that like from the cruise point? Get to meet Joe Luther and Battalion Chief who rides a big rig and takes track of everything in the city. I'm glad you could hang with us. Hope we see you next month. My name is Division Chief Jim Sedaris, and you've been watching Fire Call.